to Smart Health Talk, everyone. We're very excited today to have a very special guest. And she's all the way from Massachusetts and has a long history of being an organic farmer and supporting organic farming in general and the organic farming movement. And still, to this day, has not stopped doing that. And not only does she have her many hands organic farm uh, that she works, but she's also the executive executive director of the Northeast Organic Farming Association, Massachusetts chapter. And so she serves in that role as well. And we have brought her on as an expert to explain to us on just what goes on in that organic soil. You may have heard on the debates a couple of nights ago uh, that one of the candidates actually brought up sustainable farming as a way to reverse climate change. And that might be telling you uh, that it's the opposite kind of farming that's causing climate change. The way that we're farming our lands today are actually contributing in a major way to climate change. And here, regenerative agriculture can reverse it. So we have to like start to think, why are we not focusing on regenerative agriculture? Well, we have brought Julie Rawson on our show to give us all the reasons why we should be switching all of our farming over to regenerative agriculture because there are so many positive things that we get from it, not only reversing climate change, but so many other things. And we're going to be discussing those today and Julie is going to help us understand what really goes on in an organic farm. and maybe some things on how that would differ from some of the other things that mainstream farmers are doing. And so many people think that this is not possible. I happen to think the opposite. I happen to think it's totally possible. And so let's just get down to what's going on there at the organic farm and have a better understanding of the kind of day that Julie goes through, because I think that's probably pretty interesting. <laughs> And so, Julie, welcome to Smart Health Talk. Why don't you go ahead and <laughs> we're so glad to have you here. Why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and then give us your your version of who you are and what you do? Okay. Yes, I um, I think you you did say that I my husband and I own together Many Hands Organic Farm, which is a small. Uh, family and diversified farm in the central part of Massachusetts so we're about 75 miles straight west of Worcester oh, excuse me of Boston um, so we're right in the middle of the state and we have also for many many years since about we, we bought our land in 1980 we came out and built our house and started farming um, the land it was part of an older farm that we basically bought some hay fields in a, in a pre-existing dairy farm uh, at the time and so built a house and have really built our homestead and our farm there since uh, 1982 or so. We got involved with NOFA, the Northeast Organic Farming Association in 1984 and that's a, a local organization that really educates uh, people about how to be organic farmers. It also does a lot of advocacy work. Um, you know, we were involved at, in the early stages before there was the National Organic Program, before there was USDA Organic, um, certifying organic farmers in the state of Massachusetts. Um, there were, during the time period of between like 85 and about 2000, there were about 44 different uh, state-run certification programs around the country. And they had talked, they talked to each other a lot and they were, pretty similar in terms of what they felt was certifiably organic, but um, there was a move really to put it all together into one um, format, which is, you know, finally happened um, in 2000 and with the USDA organic. Um, there was a bit of a false start um, because, you know, as soon as the federal government got involved and there, you know, a lot of uh, organic interests at that point, new companies that were very interested in making money on organic. Previously, really organic was somewhat of a dirty word or oh, only hippies do that or, you know, just really was sidelined for many, many years. But at the point where people started talking about wanting more organic food and, and business interests realized that there was a way to make money on it, then there was a lot of push 
to adulterate, I would say, the standards. And there were there were three big things. One was um, genetically modified organisms. Another was irradiated food, and oh, I forgot. Oh, the other was the use of sewage sludge for uh, fertility that they were going to have be part of the organic program. Um, there was a huge um, backlash from the organic community saying that these things were absolutely not something that could be involved in organic farming. And it took about four years. I guess it was 96 maybe when that came, the first iteration. I'm, I'm sure, not sure my facts are all straight, but pretty sure 96 when the first iteration of the National Organic Program came out. And it took another four years until we came up with something that everybody was reasonably happy with. So 2000 was the year that um, the NOP launched essentially. Um, so that's one of the things that NOFA and many other organic farming organizations, you know, have been involved with um, in one fashion or another is trying to keep um, a, a, some sort of a standard of certification where people can say, well, I'm organic, but we need to know what that really means, right? Um, so that's one, one arm of what, what I've been involved in. The other one is just really seriously about education and helping people who want to raise the best food possible, who want to support the environment as well as they can um, and want to do it in an organic fashion. Um, that's another thing that NOFA and many of the organizations around the country who are advocacy you help organizations. You help, farmers. You help, you you help farmers. farmers. Absolutely. I mean, anybody. Um, anybody or who are farmers who want to transition, um, anybody, and gardeners also who want to um, raise better food. So people have a lot of different reasons why they come to organic food and farming. Um, and we try to you know, be supportive of all that. So um, on our farm, um, we raise, uh, presently we raise 100 turkeys for Thanksgiving. We do about 200 meat birds um, on pasture. These are on pasture also. Um, 200 meat birds for sale for chicken. And we also have about 150 chick layers for eggs. And we raise five pigs, but then we have three acres of vegetables and um, about an acre of fruit, large and small fruit. So um, sell to a number of different, um, you know, places, a, a local community support agriculture project where people pay up front and then get food for 22 weeks. Um, and then also to stores and retreat centers and such as that. Um, so we've been actively farming this land since 1982 and have really moved, I think, through our evolution as farmers. Or We were always organic, but and perhaps without as much knowledge as I, I think back, I really know a lot more about how to raise good food now than I did before. And, you know, it's a constant process of trying to be, um, you know, do a better job and be more carbon sequestering. I'm sure people have heard that term um, about, you know, as we, as we realized um, that really agriculture and, you know, well, um, considered agriculture can really have an impact on the climate crisis. Um, do you want me to talk a little bit about why that works? What's the, that? The sequestering that you said, Julie, that's really the core of uh, yeah. how, how regenerative agriculture helps pull carbon from the air. And put it back into the soil. And, and the, the, this all happens through photosynthesis, which is something that's been around a long time ever since we've had the sun. You know, you have the sun and you have water and you have um, carbon, um, carbon dioxide um, and you split molecules and then you are able to build um, plant material that uh, then works with the soil microorganisms. That's the important thing I think that we haven't realized until more recently that there's a whole universe under our feet that we can't see for the most part of um, you know well orchestrated well integrated uh, systems with many different kinds of microorganisms working together um, in collaboration with plant roots um, to photosynthesize ideally the, the, the ideal is when plants are photosynthesizing at their highest capacity. And they really can't do that unless they're working with these microbial communities. And so what we're all trying to teach ourselves now is how to best support that photosynthetic process. 
um, and it means by you know supporting the plants and supporting the microbes and they together are going to build us the soil that we really need that's going to be able to um, basically take that carbon out of the atmosphere in the form of carbon dioxide and turn it into sugars that the plants then feed out to the microbial life um, and they then in turn um, as part of their uh, relationship with the plants they return to the plants the minerals the vitamins all of the things that they need the plant secondary metabolites all the things that help those um, the plant protectant um, properties feed them back into the plant so they can grow strong and healthy they again as the stronger and healthier they are the more they are able to photosynthesize the more they're able to send more carbon into the soil and so you have this wonderful feedback system where everybody's healthy everybody's happy um, and you're at all these time at all of this time as you feed more and more carbon into the soil a lot of it will stay there and build really strong soil structure so that's kind of oh, a nutshell. Does, does that happen like when you have a, an animal grazing um, on the grass and then they eat grass? They don't, they don't pull it out so the roots are still in the, in the soil, right? So yeah. when, the cow, when the cow eats grass, what happens then? Yeah, so it's, it's very unfortunate that there is a lot of bad press out there about ruminants these days. And, you know, cows are, are the major ruminant who are on the chopping block, as it were, and people, you know, uh, you know, cowspiracy and a lot of these, these uh, movies that are out there and people going vegan and all these things because they think that it's good for the environment. Well, all we need to do is to look back in our history and understand where some of the healthiest soils in the world were and those were right in the center of this country Illinois Iowa Minnesota Nebraska you know all these all these states where they, we had the the, the um, prairie and the way that prairie got so healthy was by the grazing of the bison and other ruminants on the land and so, you know, very, very, very deep topsoil, um, very strong photosynthetic process going on there. And, you know, just so people understand, so when you feed um, cows, when you feed, feed a ruminant animal, um, you know, corn and soy and these grains, it's not how they're built. They really, they thrive on grasses that have a high lignin content they that those grasses go into their stomachs they have four stomachs to do all this work and they're able to break that down and it's like a incredible factory in there uh, a bacterial and all the other you know you know the the viruses and the fungi and all those, there are a lot of stuff going on in their stomach and they um, are able to digest that and then the manure comes out on the other end and then that really then helps to re-fertilize that soil um, and then there are a lot of like smaller animals that tiny little animals that you know thrive on um, the I'm trying to remember the um, insect that comes in and and builds a house in the cow manure and you know there's all that whole other set of species that are working on the manure and breaking that down and then turning that back into fertilizer for the soil so it's a perfect system that we have uprooted because we put our cows on these big uh, feedlots and brought in GMO corn and soy and then the animals are sick um, because they are fed these foods that are too rich for them essentially and they can't you know they can't um, their their room and, and all of their stomachs just don't work well with these high protein feeds and particularly if they've been sprayed with glyphosate and they're you know um, genetically modified and all these other things that happen that make them very poisonous for the cows essentially we have a big problem then with um, runoff from the feedlots into the vegetable areas and that's why you have these big scares where all these people are you know, E. coli scares, that's because this manure from these feedlots is running into these, um, you know, the romaine lettuce and the celery and all the various... Well, Julie, there. and the chicken, the chi these chicken operations where they have these chickens in these warehouses, and then I read in South Carolina, there's like thousands of these 
uh, warehouse facilities that have excrement ponds right next to the facility and they could be as big as a million gallons and they had all that flooding right south in carolina yeah yeah two years ago in the in the hurricane right um so you know anyway just so people need to understand that nature left to its own devices has figured all this stuff out that animals and plants and soil microbes all need to work in concert with one another and the vilification of one animal species or um, one plant species for that matter I mean I, I've always talked to people about invasives people are very upset about invasive plants but when you think about invasives what they come into the system they come into a system when the system is out of whack essentially because nature's um, major goal is to keep herself clothed at all times um, and uh, an invasive plant a an annual weed like a pigweed or, or a gallon soga or a lamb's cord or whatever those come in right away to clothe the soil and um, they're really they're really trying to save us you know that's that's their role the soil the will just blow away right Julie it'll just blow away way yeah and and just even uh, the the or carbon away with the water <laughs> and can also volatilize into the again volatilize into the atmosphere so oh, really that way too I didn't think about that yeah so that's part of you know keeping it clothed I have a, a nice little thing that we just did and know for 10 steps toward a carbon sequestering garden and I think it's useful for gardeners farmers but also for consumers and I think people sometimes get really upset about climate change as they should and you know, we just um, went through the hottest July on record worldwide um, you know things it's it's not looking good you know it really isn't and so we really are in this in a stressful place but one of the things that I got really excited about was being able to have an impact on climate change by really looking at our farming practices and mm -hmm. so not everybody farms obviously but everybody eats and that's you know that's the connection for the consumer to really demand carbon sequestering food and to understand what that means and how that how that gets about so that they can even work with their farmers and even in your yard you know if you have a yard you know making sure that you have a diversity of plants but anyway let me let me read all these um yeah these go ahead. Okay. and we can talk further about that so avoid synthetic pesticides and fertilizers both destroy the soil food web so the soil food web is all those little animals that i was talking about Synthetic, synthetic pesticides can decimate pollinator populations and garden biodiversity, including underground. Synthetic fertilizers break down soil structure, increase compaction, and reduce soil's capacity to hold water and nutrients. So, you know, synthetic pesticides and fertilizers are bad news. And so anybody who's using them needs to find a different way. And there are many, many different ways. And Julie, well, yeah, we can just talk we can go back to it, but I'd like you to explain later about the water absorption capacity and yeah. why that's so important. So we can talk okay. about that when you get through this. Okay. Minimizing soil disturbance. So exposed freshly dug soil allows soil carbon to oxidize. So if you can think about it, soil, I mean, carbon just is kind of floating around in there and it does just, you know, ox go up and com combines with oxygen and goes up into the atmosphere. Only dig when you need to and then keep it covered. This is called low or no-till gardening. Look for creative ways to implement it. And that's that's a trick. You know, we all have to kind of change our ways. It's like, oh, what's better than a nicely tilled field and everything all weeded perfectly and, you know, dirt between the rows. And we've all been taught that, that that's really the sign of a good farmer, a good gardener. It's a very clean, you know, weed-free, um, you know, monocropped situation. Um, keeping the soil surface covered. We use mulches, living ground covers like sedum, creeping phlox, strawberries, white clover, or spreading thyme. This prevents erosion by water and wind, maintains soil moisture, and keeps soil livable for the soil food web. The part about the livable for the soil food web is to remember that the microbes in the soil without a living plant root to work with basically starve to death. So when we have long periods or large areas of soil that are uncovered, besides all these other things that happen with the erosion and the oxidation, et cetera, 
the microbes are starving to death. They um, live if there are plant roots, closed case. No plant roots, they don't live. So oh, that's I, I, I never even like thought about that. Never. Yeah. Wow, yeah. that is that is so important. I never thought it, like where nothing's growing that you're actually starving the microbes in that soil. Wow. Yeah. And and it's it's really exciting too because if once you understand that and start looking at these things differently, then um, you know you can really support their their growth and their in their their um, expansion. Um, keep living roots in the soil year-round if possible. Living roots exude carbon-rich sugars and feed a host of soil-building microbes. So it's the same kind of thing that we, I just said there. Um, think deep. Deep roots in grasses and perennials release carbon-rich sugars further underground to feed the soil food web. Choose deep-rooted grasses for lawns and perennials over annuals whenever possible. Um, so yeah, perennials um, at some level are kind of the gardener's or the farmer's enemy because they're always constantly coming into the situation. And you know, learning how to um, work with those and thrive with those is, is a challenge. But thinking back on that prairie where we find that maximum um, photosynthesis and maximum soil building capacity, that's what we want to do as much as we can. And so it might mean having um, you know, uh, areas around your fields, areas around your garden that are, are um, in, in not just these, you know, short grass where you cut down your lawn and then you have to feed it again because you've killed it off and water it and do all these silly things, but to have really, you know, a nice thick mat of many different plants in your, in your lawn. Um, and or, could, could I ask you about grass? Um, sure. Because um, I have the the kind of grass that I think is the deep grass, it's not that standard sod that you buy at like Home Depot. It's uh -huh. the kind that, um, I think it's it's like the, I keep thinking uh, green, um, blue grass, but I don't, I'm not sure if that's it, but it's the kind that, it's super thick grass and it crawls and I think it goes really deep because I have a really hard time <laughs> to get rid of it where I want to get rid of it. And when my yeah. neighbor planted his lawn, he had a guy out there planting little shoots individually in the, in the ground and his is that kind of grass too. Whereas the people that are getting these sections of grass, that's the mm -hmm. kind of grass that I think is not the deep grass. This this new kind of grass that they started using that had that was, you know, the sod grass that you were buying, and it, it's just amazing to me that grass is the biggest user of water in this country, and so to me, anytime you can avoid planting grass, and I just wanted to mention too that the other thing that you said about the no till, because like right now I'm looking at, I want to put, I want to do just what you said, I want to take this big chunk of <laughs> grass area that I have in my front yard and turn it in more into a butterfly garden and things that are a healthy system uh, mm -hmm. and um, you know it's to get rid of the grass and the patches that I want instead of tilling the ground my master gardener friend was telling me that you can burn the grass by putting like cardboard on top of it right yeah and, no I've and, certainly done that on our fields oh over really the um, yeah, put down cardboard and then mulch. We have a lot of cardboard nowadays. I mean, we got cardboard coming out of our ears with Amazon coming on, so and everyone buying everything, shipping. Yeah, and and the interesting thing about cardboard, especially if you use brown cardboard that doesn't have the shininess to it and those you know shiny, um, plasticky surfaces on it. Uh -huh. um, that, the earthworms really, um, if you want to bring earthworms into your system, and, and having earthworms is really important to a healthy soil structure. They're the, you know, they're, you know, if you think about microbes and earthworms, they're monsters in comparison in size, right? And, you know, they, they basically push themselves through the soil, and in that soil there are a lot of microbes in it that they, um, uh, there's a lot of work going on inside where there's fermentation and such in their in their worm casting. So when a worm pushes itself through the soil, 
it's eating a lot of these, but they're also a lot of them working inside of its intestines. And by the time the worm castings come out at the other end, you have a higher, you know, very fertile soil with the, basically they're manuring the soil for you. So they like the cardboard because it's dark under there and they can do their, their breeding. They, you know, they don't, they, they eschew light completely where earthworms do, but they can do their work and they will layer their worm castings underneath that cardboard and then you can plant into it the next year or you know after a certain period of time depending on how hot your place is or I think, how much exciting. I think that is like an exciting way to do things it's yeah. so much i know my neighbors probably think i'm crazy because i got this pile of cardboard on there but even yeah. like underneath my plants where i don't want the ground to grow i mean you can put the cardboard down and then put mulch yeah. on top of it that's right. Yeah, it'll the last long. The bad thing right. was that it's harder to see where the gophers are dating. <laughs> um, yeah, well, that's why that's when you get cats and dogs. I mean, and that's what we have on our farm. We have a couple dogs and several cats, and they do a lot of hunting out there. I mean, there's a you know, whenever you make a um, healthy system, you're going to have a lot of animals of all sorts array arrive. And that's and even rats. Someone was writing that they had a lot of rats, and I sent them an article from the Chicago Tribune where they started using feral cats uh -huh. to get yeah, rid of the rats. And I'm yeah. like, why are we killing these cats at the shelters? Exactly. When Chicago is actually renting them to people. Yeah. Yeah. And I heard they had a problem in Australia, and I wanted to contact the person in Australia and tell them, you guys have all these feral cats in Australia. Why are you not making money off of them and getting rid of your rat problem? <laughs> so, right, right. So, no, it's really I about just got a rat last week. Yeah, working with natural systems and, and, you know, things have to be in balance. And we have to, you know, it's not about us eradicating. It's not about us being in charge so much as working with, um, you know, the other, all the, all the other life forms. And that's, that's where we've gone wrong. That's why and we that's have what you have on your farm, right, Julie? Because when I, when I heard you list all the things that you raise on your farm, I just thought that is a, that's a system. That's yeah, no, it is a farm system. system. She has all the components that you need to have in a farming system as part of her farm. Let me, um, let me read a few more of these. I've gotten through yeah, five go Use plant diversity to increase uh, soil diversity. Different plants support different communities of microbes. A wide diversity of plants encourage synergy in soil building processes. So, yeah, you know, it's like when you go to, um, a, you know, a multicultural place. Uh, we were just in London, and what a what a beautifully multi multicultural place that is. But you have all this diversity of thought and of food and of customs, and you know, all of a sudden you're operating in a place where things are pretty exciting and pretty vibrant. And it's the same way to thinking about the soil diversity. But yes, different plants will um, emphasize the need for different um, communities of microbes. So that just helps build things. Use workhorses, uh, workhorse plants or cover crops to build organic matter. Um, they can also add nitrogen like clover, um, create mulch like buckwheat when, when it dies, suppress weeds like rye, break up compacted soil like daikon, which is, you know, the, the daikon radish, or keep your soil covered over the winter like oats and peas. So thinking about all the various ways that cover crops can um, help build your system. Um, make and use compost, add materials to encourage a wide range of life, such as woody material, kelp, rock dust, lime, clay, wood ash, biochar, and food scraps. So again, you know, kind of build, do it yourself fertilizers. Um, add um, seasonal biochar. When blended with compost, biochar can add stable soil carbon, hold water, and be a host for beneficial microbes. Be careful when first applied, too much pure biochar can uh, temporarily bind up um, nutrients in the soil. Can you and explain biochar? Because um, I've heard a lot of new research on biochar, and I it was kind of a new one to me. I really wasn't very familiar with it, but I thought yeah. it sounded exciting. Yeah, I, I'm not a real fan of biochar. I think People have been able to use it to good advantage. It takes, um, you know, I think some of the commercially developed biochars are uh, pretty. Um, I think they were using a new material to make yeah. biochar. Was yeah. the, what I was reading. I think that's right. I think that's right. I, I'm not. I, 
can't really talk talk um, intelligently about biochar. Sorry. Okay. Um, yeah, <laughs> but it's something that you buy um, from like a feedlot or. Well, I you know it just it's a it's a been cooked at a really high uh, temperature. It's like charcoal cooked really high temperature, and as I understand it, there's a lot of space in there for microbes to kind of move into that those that area and kind of protect themselves and. Um, it's a way to add carbon, but I, I frankly think the best way to add carbon is to grow really healthy plants. Um, uh, so anyway, observe changes in the soil to measure your success. Is the soil darker, more organic matter? Is this topsoil deeper? Does it hold more water? Do you see more diversity in life above and below ground? So that's, you know, observing your success. Um, is well, and, the, and, the hold, and the hold water thing, like I said, that um, because you were talking about building the organic matter and can you explain to people what happens uh, to the water absorption capacity, like with every inch of organic matter that you build in that soil and why it's so precious that we hold on to it and not let it blow away? Or yeah, well, when you have soil compaction, water will hit the soil and then run off. And also, if the hit water is hitting the soil, specifically the dirt, you know, the, the bare dirt, it's, it fractures the structure of that soil, and it's very, very difficult, very, very hard on it. Soil is not si soil was not developed to be, um, you know, hit to be rain. hit with rain. Um, there's a great book, uh, Water in Plain Sight, um, which I encourage people to read to really understand that. Judith Schwartz wrote that, and she has a whole chapter on, you know, the damage that rainfall. Um, just average rainfall can do on a soil that's um, uncovered, essentially. Oh. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, so we want to have that's poor important. structures. Yeah, poor structures that are um, there's enough space between them, essentially. And when you have very extensive roots growing in your system, the roots, um, you know, kind of burrow through the soil and make all these pore spaces available. And when they die. Um, there's even more space available in there. And that's, um, you know, the whole system, the whole, whole sort of photosynthetic system is based on these plants roots, you know, digging berries into the soil and then using mycorrhizal fungi, which I haven't even discussed yet today. Mycorrhizal fungi will um, attach themselves to the roots. They build a lot of lateral um, hyphae to collect water, to bring back nutrients, etc. But they um, form a, a huge, you know, a underground internet system, essentially, for the plants. And the more you have going on down there, the more root systems, the more hyphae from the fungi, the more earthworm burrows and holes. I mean, earthworms, you know, you probably have seen after a rain, sometimes you'll see little spots where they've come up in the, in the night. Um, uh, you know, the burrows are also open these passages. So when you have all that life going on, when rain comes, it will absorb into the soil and it'll be held there for whenever it's needed. So in um, in periods of too much rain, which is happening with the climate change, you know, we have these, we had a rainstorm yesterday. It was about 20 minutes long and we got about an inch and an uh, inch and a quarter or something in 20 minutes. You know, it just comes down in buckets, right? Um, you get too much rain and then you also have too much drought. But if you have your microbes in place and your ground um, covered in place, that, that soil can tolerate um, less water or it can tolerate more water depending on what it can it can tolerate excess of one or the other because it has this incredible water holding capacity I think about you think about a brand new um, sponge I mean, if you buy a nice sponge and you know fill it one time you know the first time you rinse it fill it full of water and rinse it out it's very absorbent and then you think of an old, you know, brittle sponge, which has gotten very thin and it's very hard for it to get any water in it again. That's what we can consider how much water you can hold in a brand new sponge versus an old hard one that's been sitting around for too long and been in use for too long. And that's a, a way to maybe to envision the soil and see how that, that water holding capacity is, is um, enhanced by following all these practices. Well, and so, uh, there, there's a question I've had for a long time because I'm fascinated by the fungi. Mm -hmm. And 
And I, I now, now that I listen to you, I understand more how they start off by like attaching to the roots. And then you said they have these, it, it's hyphae. Is that what you said? They're, yeah. yeah they're kind of, little, little fingers. Mm-hmm. And, and they come out, they come out from the roots. Now I wondered like these highways, they're, they're pretty much like highways that they're building. Right. Now, let's say that, um, the roots that they attach to that, that plant needs a certain nutrient. Mm-hmm. Is it possible for them to bring a nutrient from a place that wasn't directly touching the plant? That's and right. That's supplying, exactly what they can do. Supplying that to that plant. That is something I've always wondered. Yes. No, that's exactly what they do. They, they <gasps> basically so cool. increase the plant's um, reach, essentially. So they, they in, increase it. They can by several magnitudes depending on how long uh, you've kept from disturbing the soil there. Um, you know, if they can stay in place. How awesome is that, that you wouldn't even have the nutrients right there. It'd be like, hey, you know, we could really use some of those. Can you like uh, go look for some? And it could be looking like, you know, a few feet or maybe longer from where the plant is actually located for that nutrient and then bringing it through this, this fungi highway, bringing it to that plant. I mean, I just think that's like the coolest thing. (laughs) What a system. And then we go and we stick our shovel in it and you pretty much like cut the highway in two so that it's not functioning the same way. Is that what you're saying? Well, yeah, I mean, and and obviously it's very hard to raise raise food without disturbing the soil somewhat, especially if you're on a larger scale. And that's what there's been a lot of development of appropriate tools and roller crimpers that knock down um, and kill. Yes, um, I, I talked about you know, that, Rodale um, yeah. crimper. I thought that yeah. you could grow the fetch, which was the cover crop, and then I love that how they had it so you could break the ground cover down, and then in the back, you're cutting through the ground cover and planting a seed, and so then it has this carpet on top of it of this fetch protecting the seed and when you have a ground cover on top of the soil like that explain to people what's happening because that ground cover is is doing so many different things to that soil yeah well it's you know it's obviously providing all the uh all the nutrient for the uh, for the soil microorganisms to do their thing with the roots i think the hard thing for farmers on any kind of scale is to um, be able to knock those down and, and essentially kill them at the right moment like rye for example is at, at the at the milk stage before it sets head um, but in the process before the head is before the seed is viable essentially is very weak in the stalk because it's been putting all of its energy into the seed and so that's the time to um, you know crimp it or cut it or whatever so it won't come back um, but you have to be your timing has to be impeccable um, to to work with these perennials um, like rye and vetch. You know, boy, I don't I don't know when you can take vetch down when it won't come right back. I've not seen that, but um, you know that's one of the things that people do. I think another thing that people do is well, a lot of of us are around in the east anyway are using uh, silage tarps, which are these black tarps that we kind of the larger version of putting down cardboard and hay on top of it to kill the um, to kill the the um, you know the the sod or whatever it is you're trying to do and the black and so, heat. Yeah, heat. Yeah, yeah it it helps basically the the crop will continue to you know grow under there but then it'll get too hot and it'll break down and it'll it'll break down and then it, it you know you take it off and then you're able to plant into a clean bed without having tilled so yeah you're killing some of the vegetation but you want to do this in a short term fashion so that you're back in there um, offering again to those those fungi and uh, all the bacteria, et cetera, you know, another food source. So when we farm, we are disrupting the system and we have to think about ways to enhance it as much as we can. So uh, one of the other things that I just wanted to touch on is uh, um, the use of appropriate fertility. And 
um, one of the things that we really believe in and have improved our farming system dramatically by understanding the mineral needs of the plants. And there's a lot of research out there and there are a lot of good agricultural consultants that help people understand what the mineral needs are there of the plants and then actually um, applying those things in a foliar fashion, very small amounts of them in a foliar fashion on the leaves um, because the leaves will actually uh, uptake minerals quite well. It'll help enhance that photosynthesis and get things going and getting the, that root system you growing. Spray them on a in a liquid form? Is that what you Yeah, we, we mix it into a tank with water and where, um, where spray it. From? What's where, that? Where, where, where do you buy minerals from? Where, what kind oh, of well, I, I get them from a company called Advancing Eco Agriculture, but there are a lot of companies out there that are doing these kinds of things. And the other thing that they're doing is, you know, effectively using um, sea minerals, um, you know, sea minerals, but also kelp and some of these, a lot of the, you know, kelp is an incredible um, growth stimulant. Um, so adding a little kelp to your tank will really stimulate um, the, um, the grow, growing of the the new the new shoots and such and the tips on the plants. So, and the other thing that people um, that you know a lot of um, some of the agricultural companies are developing are um, bacterial and fungal um, you know inoculants that you can put in there to help really speed that process along. So that way you can certainly you know drench, which means putting stuff into the soil um, with those minerals too. To get things off to a good start, we basically want to get the roots growing as fast as we can and give that plant the, the most chance it can. And so um, with the idea that if you really um, have figured out the nutritional needs of the plant, if you're doing all these things with biodiversity and keeping the soil covered and, um, you know, addressing the proper fertility needs, then you end up with much um, healthier crops, more abundant crops. Um, less and, pests. and and more no yeah less to no pests really and then really um, highly nutritious crops also so our as a dietitian <laughs> that's what I'm looking for I'm looking yeah. for food that can actually nourish and heat heal people okay. you know right. yeah that's that's what we should be doing um, we have to you know at our time and place a lot of our soil has been so ravaged for so many generations that our food is not very healthy that we kind of have it on a, um, uh, you know, what I want to say, you've got it on a drip almost. We're trying to, we're trying to prop it up, you know, with various, um, you know, biological or chemical either. I mean, some, you know, a lot of organic growers really don't understand that whole fertility thing and they're trying to do the best thing. They're not using chemicals, but they're really propping up um, a very sick plant. And um, so that's what we need to do is to really, uh, work toward uh, raising very healthy plants that are going to, once they are healthy, they are able to withstand, um, for example, the, um, you think about the fungi that will attack, uh, like, so you're talking about your monarch butterflies, but the fungi that will attack um, basil or, you know, the uh, cucurbit family, the cucumbers and squashes and such you get the downy and yeah, I've seen that stuff <laughs> so they can't um, those fungi basically are in spores are in the air but if the if the leaf of that plant is so sturdy and so strong um, then the fungi can't attach themselves they basically really? can't get inroads in there and that's how you that is amazing avoid. like the Asian citrus psyllid that they were like spraying like crazy I had um, I had someone that did a, a they did a experiment and they were actually able to bring a sick uh, orchard back and they said the problem is the pesticides are making the plants so weak that they become easily accept, um, a prey for this Asian citrus psyllid when it would normally never affect them. Right. Right. And you see, I noticed the first aphids were on my weakest plants in my whole in my whole garden. Yeah. Just those two plants that I knew were in like really yucky soil. I knew I needed to change it and I hadn't. Yeah. And sure enough, that was the ones that the aphids came to first. So think about this, you know, that nature has um, ha has a plan. And that, you know, all these insects that come in and eat 
you know, sick plants are basically doing a very important service. Um, just as dogs and hyenas and buzzards eat dead animals, right? Some, you know, there's some um, predators that only eat live animals, but some are specifically like the dead animals. And the reason that is, and the reason that we have insects that will take out a plant is because they're trash collectors. And in, in nature, if we didn't have the trash collectors, we would, we would um, be completely um, overrun by dead material. Everything lives and everything dies. But somebody's got to take that material and turn it back into soil again. And that's, so really they're doing, um, they're doing us all a service when they come in and take out a bad plant. Um, so we have to really think about it differently that here here's nature saying this plant is unhealthy and it has to go you know the it, in some in some sense that survival of the fittest we really want survival we want the strongest. Strong. yeah the strongest one so so when we have like these um, extreme weather conditions too like you were saying <clears throat> excuse me you were saying earlier that the plant will be able to withstand more extremes including like frost you know things that can take out an entire field yeah uh, that they will they will be more resistant even to something like frost well i had um i i listened to a podcast um and i encourage people to check out the advancing eco agriculture uh site they have very good podcasts very good webinars if you really want to go in deeply into this but he was um interviewing this um fruit grower, I think they were cherries, and um, he had been a conventional grower who had been using lots of chemicals, and he decided to go half organic and slash bio biological and really start using these mineral sprays and, and mineral amendments and doing more organic systems, and then he kept this other old system, which was basically chemicals, you know, for everything, and um, there was a severe drop in temperature, I think it was like 40 degrees one night, and every single tree in the conventionally run orchard died. And every single tree that was run in this more biological system thrived and, you know, made it through that, that sphere. That is incredible. Yeah. That is yeah. huge. Um, yeah. So, oh my God, you know, that, think of that. that's going to have to be our, it's going to have to be our, our way moving forward is to not be defensive, but be proactive um, and really um, you know, try to build, and it's true, you know, we only have a couple minutes left here, but, you know, same for the human gut biome, diversity, lots of different kind of foods, lots of roughage, you know, do everything you can to feed all of those little microbes that live in your system so that they can really sort things out themselves. The bad guys will be wiped out by the good guys because they essentially want to keep you alive so that they can live there and operate there, right? Um, and that's, you know, that's the overwhelming desire of the microbial community is to keep the host alive. Um, and the pathogens come in only to take things out when it's time for something to go. Um, so that's, you know, that's what we need to build for. And, you know, and, and all this works out that, uh, you know, we can, we can start to have a system that's not adding to climate change, but actually reversing climate change. Dr. Jonathan Lundgren, who is a USDA scientist, said if we just started grazing all our animals, we could offset all the carbon produced in this country right now. Yeah, just by grazing the animals. So all those the things that you said about the factory farms was so <laughs> spot on. Yeah. That's exactly what Dr. Lundgren said. And I don't know why... I, I, you know, I was just, I know we only have like about another minute, but I was just thinking, I don't know how the whole corn fed beef thing started, uh, but I don't, what would you say to people um, about, you know, grass fed meat? Because I get meat that it's only been on, you know, fields and that's it. Yeah. Uh, I just, my, what I say to people is, as as consumers, all of us are consumers. Even if we're farmers, we still buy food, and we can turn this around really quickly by being very assertive about what kind of food we want to put in our mouths. And you know, there the systems will come, and you know, and these big companies that are, you know, even Monsanto's and Bayer's and all those people that are trying to making money now with this chemical paradigm will switch. 
if that's how they can make money and you know it's it comes down to that bottom line and if there are people out there clamoring for food that's raised in a certain way things will turn around very quickly so there's there's a lot of hope and there's a, just a lot of opportunity for all of us to make a big difference and make in this change and bring this about can, can people get that um, PDF of the the ten? Um, yeah, sure. And I, I'm and also I just would like to refer you to the NOFA Mass website because we have a carbon page. It's nofamass.org/carbon, and on that page we have a lot of these resources. And we have a booklet called um, Can Biology. What's it? What's the name of it? Sorry, it's um, and that's. N as in Nancy, it's, O is an opera, F is in farming, and then A is an apple, right? Nofa Mass. Yeah, Nofa Mass. And, and, and then M A S S. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, the Soil Carbon Restoration Can Biology Do the Job is a nice pamphlet we have. It's a 12 page little booklet. We also have a, another booklet called The Carbon Sequestering Garden um, with more, you know, more facts and figures and help for people about how to. Um, the the first one, the kind of biology do the job really under explains the whole system, and the other one really talks about how to do it. Um, but we have a lot of videos, um, and so nofamass.org slash carbon, um, but also the Advancing Eco Agriculture site um, on there. You'll also see a lot of webinars, and and um, there's a lot it's of stuff. It's a great there. organization. It is. It, I mean, you guys were kind of like the the heart of. Uh, they had things going on in California, but I know that you guys were at the forefront there with all the work that you've done, and you were right there uh, at the beginning, and I just want to thank you so much, you and your family, so much for what you've done to even, like, you know, be organic farmers. I know it's not easy, and the profit margin isn't as much, and you, I know that you do it from the heart um, to bring people healthy food. and. That's. I wish we could just like duplicate you like, over and over again. Well, I have a lot of fun. I have a lot of fun raising food. And when I, we went out and we had these yesterday. Um, the maybe the third big har third harvest of you had two 150 foot rows of cucumbers. They were just one plant in each row. I mean, just one row. Two 250 foot rows of cucumbers, and we've harvested like 30 gallons of cucumbers yesterday. Time to Best make <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. But the best, you know, the best crop we've had ever because we're really just honing in on, you know, excessive mulch, excessive, um, you know, uh, you know, we've been no-till for four years now. Oh, um, okay. Really yeah. um, running our animals through there at the end of the season so and using everything that you've been talking about. Now you yeah. you're starting to see the results of oh, putting absolutely. these different things together, and you're just you're overwhelmed even after all your years of farming you're seeing something really great happening yeah yeah and longevity of the plants you know they don't they don't um, you know submit to disease right away they you know they'll, they'll stick around the whole season so that's that's, that's, pretty pretty farmers. <laughs> that's how you make money right yeah. <laughs> you know if you have more if you get more produce out of one plant then I I definitely think that that was a plus and I want to find out all the ways that we can make farmers successful yeah so um, you know we got to get more people getting educated by you Julie <laughs> <laughs> I know that I know that for sure <laughs> okay, well, I'm so glad that we have this video to start to yeah. get you get the word out there and start helping people understanding more about the benefits of regenerative agriculture, especially related to climate change. And I just want to thank you for your time today. I know you got lots of other important things to do, so I won't hold you back. And everyone, at Many Hands Organic Farm, if you want to go and check out Julie Ross. We ship, and her we ship actually. <laughs> Pardon me. I say we ship. We ship lard, for example. We have fantastic lard. So oh, we'll you ship we'll lard. Ship I'm going to be the first. I'm going to be a customer. I am yeah, going yeah. to be a customer because you know what? As a dietitian, I happen to know that lard is the biggest source of vitamin D mm, in right. any other food out you there. It. You got and it. We have yes. people that you know they maybe they can't be in the sun. I happen to not be afraid of the sun because I eat healthy. Yeah. Um, and I think sun and vitamin D is very important. I just get safe, try to get safe sun. But for a food source, lard is it. And how they take taken lard out of our system, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> thank you so much, Julie. All right, thank right. you. Bye-bye.